people detained at these airports where people are protesting tonight. Joining me now to talk about this is former mayor of New York City and advisor to President Trump on cybersecurity, Rudy Giuliani. All right, good evening, Judge, uh, Mr. You? Mayor. I am fine. This just breaking <laughs> news during my open. Federal judge signing uh, this stay. What can you tell us about it? Well, I think it's... Uh First of all, I thought your opening was absolutely a terrific explanation of what's been wrong with this country for 20, 30 years. Uh, good deal of time that you were district attorney. I was U.S. attorney in the Southern District right. of New York, and I couldn't get the immigration service to deport the criminals who were coming out of jail. They put them on bail and they commit more crimes, and then I have to arrest them again. And it's totally absurd. What Donald Trump wants to do, what Homeland Security wants to do under him, is focus on the criminal illegal aliens and get them out of the United States. Who possibly could object to that? I, I, I have no you idea know, what these mayors are thinking about. I, I don't know what they're thinking about either, and I have the same problem. I would seek to have someone deported after they served their jail time. Their country didn't want them, so the United States would say, okay, we'll keep them. Well, then or what we should do we is... What we should yeah. do is, first of all, we should develop detention centers for them. They shouldn't be, shouldn't be catch and release. They shouldn't go to jail for five years for assault or attempted murder or selling drugs and then go back out on the street. They should go right. into a detention center. They should be I held. Agree. They should be held. And then we should exert all the pressure that we have, which is enormous, by the way, to deport them to the countries where they're supposed to go to. Because and they in fact, in the executive action that the pre President Trump just signed, he talked about limiting visas from those countries that refuse to accept criminals uh, back to their countries. They say these countries that say, oh, no, he's too, too dangerous for us to take back. Well, here's the deal. Now we're going to pull you by the short hairs. You can't come here. But but that that makes perfect sense. And now we've got a president who gets it. Thank well, goodness. That, that actually describes his whole first week in office, which is negotiating in the best interests of the United States of America, not the rest of the world, but protecting our citizens from what's happened with illegal criminal immigrants and in a lot of other areas. Uh, this last week, I think, has been a week that where he has done more than Roosevelt did in 100 days. Uh, I, I don't think there's any question. He, he, he not only hit the ground running, the, he's been airborne since the first 24 hours. <laughs> he doesn't but sleep. Mayor, he does, uh, I, yeah. I know this. I know that. He does, we, you, both you, do. we, we both know him personally, right? <laughs> this yes. man doesn't sleep. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But I want to ask you about this ban. I want to ask you about this ban and the protest. Does the ban have anything to do with religion? How did the president decide the seven countries? Uh, I understand the permanent ban on the refugees. Okay. Uh, um, and, okay, um, talk to me. Tell you the whole history of it. So right. when he first announced it, he said Muslim ban. He called me up. He said, put a commission together. Show me the right way to do it legally. I put a commission together with Judge Mukasey with Congressman McCall, Pete King, whole group of other very expert lawyers on this. And what we did was we focused on, instead of religion, danger. The right. air areas of the world that create danger for us, which is a factual basis, not a religious basis. Perfectly legal, perfectly sensible, and that's what the ban is based on. It's not based on you... religion. It's based on places where there are substantial evidence that people are sending terrorists into our country. Well, let me ask you this. When, when you know, I was kind of surprised to see that Saudi Arabia and Pakistan are not on the list. And yet, you know, we know that the uh, San Bernardino attack by Syed Farouk and uh, Malik, uh, uh, I think her name was Tashfi Malik, she was born in Pakistan and then came through Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, wh why were some of those countries okay, well, left I'll, out? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is going through a massive change. I think the kingdom, particularly under the new prince, has a real understanding that we're dealing with a massive radical Islamic terrorist problem. It is not the old Saudi Arabia. This isn't the Saudi Arabia of 
2000, 2001, 2002. Uh, President Obama is dealing with a new Saudi Arabia, which the is President Trump. Uh, yeah, uh, pre 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 President Trump rather is dealing with a very different Saudi Arabia than President Obama was dealing with, and a Saudi Arabia that has much closer relationships with Israel and with us if we know how to use it correctly. Pakistan, okay, well, Pakistan, I would have to know more about. That troubles right. me a little bit like yeah. it troubles you. All right, all right. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you know, I can't believe I'm not in New York tonight. You and I are always try I don't know. To we, never, we miss each other all the time. <laughs> all right. It's good to see you, though. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Anytime. Time. And oh, thank you. Time for a different opinion. Joining me now is former foreign policy advisor to Barack Obama, presidential campaign, and former State Department official David Tafuri. All right, David, good to have you on the show. Thanks for, for having the me. the first time. Okay, now we just found out that a federal judge has uh, put a ban or a stay, I should say, on the president's ban. This, this te the, and it's a temporary stay. Do you know who the judge is, the federal uh, judge who put the, ban the stay on the ban? I don't. I learned about this from watching the beginning of your show, uh, and yeah, I tried I to look really quickly. Maybe we can find out uh, uh, who, who put this, the uh, uh, temporary stay on that but what all right what is your opinion of this of this ban and are you surprised that the stay has been implemented talk to me this executive order is a mess the reason is that it doesn't accomplish the US interests in protecting us from terrorism let me give you an example this bans visit visits from people from seven different countries but the the last terrorist attacks in the US San Bernardino which you mentioned Orlando the New York New Jersey bombings the people who did those terrorist attacks didn't come from any of these seven countries they weren't included at all and yet the the ban is but, actually but, too but broad it prevents that, people that like Ashfeen Malik. Uh, OK, she is from two of the countries that were not included. Right. right. OK. The, the San Bernardino Orlando bombers, they came from Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Don't you think that the White House, I mean, don't you think that they have some sense of what's going on, that they have intelligence that we don't have, that maybe they have stuff that's more contemporary than than, you know, you and I have from months ago? We have great people in our intelligence community, great people in the military working on this. My guess is the people that wrote this are not those people. The people who wrote this executive order probably haven't been to the Middle East, don't know that much about the Middle East. They've fashioned an order. They fashioned that? because they've fashioned an order that does not protect us and actually bans huge groups of people who are actually our friends who we need to wait support minute, us wait, wait in minute. the fight Why against do you ISIS. Assume that people from Somalia are our friends when I mean the number you go to Minnesota, you, we just had an attack there on Thanksgiving. There's a lot of assaults and a lot of attacks by some of these. But I'm I know what you're saying. Saying. All people from no, Somalia no, are, are good are. people. Of course, there are bad people are. in Somalia. Of course, there are bad people in Iraq. But there are good people in Iraq who work with us, who work with the U.S. military. Okay. We've ended a refugee resettlement program that was designed to reward the Iraqis who helped the U.S. military in the fight against ISIS. Let me give you an example. I served in Iraq in 06 and 07, the height of the war. I had two Iraqis who helped me. Their lives became in danger because they were helping Americans. I and others helped them get through the refugee resettlement program. They were re resettled here in the U.S. as a reward to their good service and risking their lives and helping but, us. But and David, they're good, law-abiding citizens I now. Every single military person, who, every military person who served in Iraq or Afghanistan or anywhere else in the Middle East will tell you that we need okay, a refugee resettlement that, okay, program. We need to reward okay, the people so you know, who help us. We gotta go. Just so you know, there, there are exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis. And I suspect that that's the kind of guy, just like the guy who was the translator for the Army, uh, former U.S. Army translator, got in today. The, the order makes stuck, it clear. But he got stuck for he a couple stuck. days. You know what? Deal with it. We're in the middle of a there terrorist war. There are women and war. kids stuck in the airport. What? Why fashion an executive order that prevents grandmas from coming to you the U.S.? You know what? It's just like they told us grandmothers were coming from Central America and they were all teenagers and men. But anyway, David, I love having you on. You're smart. We'll have you back. David Thank Tempfury. you. Fury. All right. Next, more of the breaking news from the nation's airports. Plus, one-on-one -on -one in the White House with the president's right-hand woman. She's talking tough on immigration. You have an entryway here, but you can't break the law and then allow these liberal elites to tell everyone you need. Illegal immigrants are here to do the jobs Americans just want to do. My interview with Kellyanne Conway from inside her West Wing office is next. You can't miss it. Stay right where you are. 
Welcome back to Justice. Another live look at Kennedy Airport in New York. One of several seeing protests tonight. A federal judge has just granted a stay to temporarily allow people who landed in the U.S. with valid visas to stay in the country. This will affect the people detained at these airports where people are protesting tonight. Meantime, I'm here in Washington this week because I visited the White House and had the opportunity to sit down with counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway. Take a look. It's been a whirlwind week. I mean, I can't even believe that it has been a week given all the president's done. It's How do classic, you feel? It's classic <laughs> President Donald Trump style though, Janine. It's exactly who he's been in business as a candidate, as president-elect and now president. He's all about action and impact. I mean, Washington is just not accustomed to somebody who comes here owing them nothing and owing the American people the opportunity to make good on those promises and those plans. And he's done everything from job creation to wage boosting to protecting us from radical Islamic terrorism by putting out extreme vetting from swearing in a couple of the cabinet secretaries. Uh, let's just throw in a visit from the UK's prime minister for good measure, calls with heads of state. It's just remarkable to watch him in action. And it, it, it really makes us all step up our game. Do you get the sense as you watch him, and I've known him for many, many years, that there'll come a point in time when some of his staff will say, I don't know if I can keep up with this man. Oh, sure, <laughs> but too bad for us. <laughs> too bad for us. Uh, he, I've always thought, even when I had my own research company for 21 years, that the boss should always work the hardest. You know, your mm -hmm. name's on the door, you're in charge, so work the hardest. But he puts that at a different echelon altogether. Without but you can't help but want to meet and accept exceed his expectations and try to at least keep pace with his thinking, with his activity. It's a joy and I, the country's responding. You know, you see some of the haters out there, but no mind because he's their president too and he's doing things that will help them as well. What, what, I, what I want people to know is that for every loudmouth hater you hear, there have got to be 10 or more people now who are calling and emailing and writing and stopping and saying thank you to any of us, to him, to tell him thank you. People feel there's a new vibrancy, a new buoyancy, a new opportunity. He's not just changing the tone in Washington, he's changing the whole content. And the whole idea of his doing what he said he would do it is just kind of stunning to the American people. Well, oh my goodness, not only is he doing what he said he would do, but he's doing a lot of it in the first week. Okay. But let's talk about what happened with Mexico and the talk now of possibly a 20% tax on some of the goods coming from Mexico. And then, you know, critics saying, well, that whether it's 20 or any other number, I think Sean Spicer may have suggested 20, that that, that burden may ultimately be held by or burdened on the American people. Uh, is he running the this like he the president like a business sure he can run the country like a business but he also knows it's a country well, on mexico what our press secretary sean spicer said is one of the possible options our chief of staff Mm -hmm. Ryan Spivas has said the 20% tariff is on the buffet of options. Mm -hmm. And that's the way leaders look at things. They say, what are all the possibilities here? I want to weigh the consequences, the options, the possibilities before I make a choice on behalf of the American people. Who needs the other one more? Does the United States need Mexico or does Mexico need the United States? Well, if you look at the trade imbalance, uh, $60 billion of a trade deficit each year, and you see these statistics, Janine, that the the greatest source of revenue for Mexico appears to be money that Mexicans in American America send back to Mexico. Well then let me ask you, why is it that the Mexicans seem so put off by the idea of the United States as a sovereign nation putting up a wall, the United States saying we do not want illegal immigrants here, the United States doing what it can to stop illegal drug cartels right. from coming into this country, and the United States from taking care of its own borders and preventing people from sending money into another country. Well, they're just not using to it, but look, <laughs> Donald Trump has said as president that he will put America first, and 65% of Americans say that they really like and agree with that as, as one of his plans, as one of his mottos, if you will, America first. Uh, that was in a poll this week that was released. And there's something to that. People know what that means. It means that we're a sovereign nation, and sovereign nations must have physical borders. And we as a nation 
as the president said in his inaugural address, we have spent billions of dollars helping other countries protect their own borders and their own sovereignty, and we're not doing it here. It's just common sense to a lot of the American people. We want to have a good relationship with all of our neighbors, Canada, Mexico. President Trump said today, he said on Friday in his press conference with the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Theresa May, he said, we'd like to have good relationships with all countries. Probably won't happen, but we'll try. And that, of course, includes Mexico. But this is all about being fair to the American people, to the American borders, to the American worker. Well, then why do you think that there are some mayors from the large cities, American cities, American mayors, who are like, we want to protect the illegals and we're willing to risk the loss of federal block grants, law enforcement monies? What is that about? It seems to be a, a, a sort of misread on the public mood, first of all. Are, are they really serious that they're going to harbor and, quote, protect illegal immigrants like the man who murdered Kate Steinle in front of her father uh, in San Francisco almost two years ago? That poor woman should be a household name across this country, and we should hold her up as a symbol of everything that's wrong with sanctuary cities. And if people say, Judge Janine, well, that's just one example. We have many examples. At the Department of Homeland Security this past week, President Trump stood along with these angel moms, all of whom have lost their children to illegal immigrants who should not have been here. And so that is not all illegal immigrants. That is most. That is not most immigrants in this country. But these mayors saying that they're going to put the protection of illegal immigrants above the protection of their own people and their own city's resources, they're flagrantly flouting the law. Exactly. And we should think about what that means. Maybe some are making political statements, maybe some really believe that they're protecting the illegal immigrants, but those folks broke the law. You want to be in America? We've got the most generous immigration laws in the world, and we have big hearts as well. Uh, we're compassionate. Go stand in line. Go do it the way our ancestors did it, and most people's ancestors did it. You have an entryway here, but you can't break the law and then allow these liberal elites to tell everyone, Janine, illegal immigrants are here to do the jobs Americans just won't do. You know what many Americans have stood up and said, particularly given the Trump effect on this issue? Excuse me, I will do that job. I want to do that job to support mm -hmm. myself and my family, but I'm not doing it for $5 an hour under the table. And that's not all. More with Kellyanne Conway coming up. What about your kids? Are you worried about them? I'm a mother. Of course I'm worried about them. I'm an Italian mother. Kellyanne the mother in the public glare. Part two of my White House interview is next. You'll even find out who once worked in her White House office. And you're going to be really surprised. Then my all-star political panel is here to weigh in on the president's actions on extreme vetting and sanctuary cities. You can bet on some fireworks. Stay with us on Justice. Welcome back to Justice. Here's part two now of my White House interview with Kellyanne Conway, where we talked about her history-making role in the Trump administration. Kellyanne, the woman. We've heard a lot about uh, White House counsel. You are counselor to the president. Very different. Don McCann is White House yes. counsel. Your job is very different. Yes. Very unusual. You're sitting in an office, which I'm yet to decorate. I'm terrible. I can't decorate, design, or draw anything. So, But I'm sure my, my kids will start hanging things on the wall soon, Judge. But this is an office that was uh, previously occupied by Valerie Jarrett, very close, if not the closest advisor to President Obama, and before her, Karl Rove. And before that, here's a great piece of trivia, First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. Remember, she famously had an office yes. in the West Wing, yes. even though the East Wing is where the First Lady's office is. So, so the significance of that is that you are very close to the Oval Office. Yes. How far is that? Well, more importantly, I'm very close to the president. I think we're in close. Well, it's a floor below. He's right below. Do you have like a winding staircase? Uh, no, like but I can get there. Into, I can get like there. <laughs> I can get there. I can get there in twelve. I can get there in twelve minutes. Um, yeah. Scandal's one of the only shows I watch on TV. Yeah. Uh, I can get there in, in twelve minutes. Twelve seconds. I can get there in twelve seconds. I've done it in three and a half inch heels. I'll show yeah. you. What's it but, like um, the first time you came in? Let's 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 talk about personal. First time you came in, you did you go? Oh my God, this is so history. This is so historical. You do feel the gravity and the enormity, but also the humility that comes with something like this. You know, I was raised by a single mom in a wonderful house of uh, Italian women. 
And it's, I think that it's the American dream writ large in many ways, but I think Donald Trump's ascendancy to the presidency is the American dream writ large. People have been saying for decades, Judge, that we want somebody who's doesn't has, has great experience, but not as a politician and not in government. And they got him. They, they made good on their self, you know, self-avowed desire of many years. And for me, it's, it's, uh, it's euphoric, but it's also a tremendous responsibility. When I was a DA, uh, I was the first woman DA. There were a lot of people who had trouble just with the fact that I had bodyguards, security. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of resistance, a lot of hate, uh, a lot of criticism, and that was in the 90s. What, what is it like for you now? You know, there's Sean Spicer, he's in front of cameras, and Ryan's Priebus, and, and yet you're the one that people are focused on. Why do you think that is? Why do you need round-the-clock security? Well, there have been threats to me and my family, and I have four small children, 12, 12, 8, and 7, who don't deserve to be a target of anything but love and affection and to have a normal childhood like anyone else. And it turns out that there are people who have a problem with women in power, and many of them are women, unfortunately. I mean, look at the ridicule I faced by wearing a Gucci yeah. coat to Donald Trump's inauguration. I have to laugh because he thought it was he thought it was a beautiful coat. I got lots of compliments on I it mean, at the Pentagon. Man, you work so hard <laughs> for so long. First woman to get a president elected. You're not entitled to wear an outfit that you think is patriotic. Whose business is it? Well, it, frankly, it's no one's business. Right. And that's that's one thing I want everybody to know. They, they all pretend that they're so independent minded and we're such part of the sisterhood yeah. and we're all locking arms together. And it turns out it's not true. And I very tongue-in-cheek uh, said to a reporter this week, hey, I apologize to the black stretch pants wearing <laughs> women of America <laughs> for adding a pop of color and panache to the inauguration. Yeah, red, white, they blue made fun while of me, we're from, at it. <laughs> from Paddington Baird, you should be a Barbie doll too. Uh, but I just want them to know you're wasting your breath because mm -hmm. there's no way anyone is going to redefine or unravel me and 140 characters are left. Why do women feel better about themselves by putting someone down? We really have to reflect upon that. And I reflect upon it less as counselor to the president because it's not relevant. I reflect on it as a mother of three daughters mm -hmm. who are 12, 8, and 7. And I've been trying to teach them, be impervious to your naysayers and critics and just focus on who you are and what your value is. And it just it, it's just so ironic to me that we spend billions of dollars a year on self-help books and strategies for for self-growth and everything. How about just being kinder to each other? How just how about just being a better friend? Listen, you want to walk around in your yoga pants all day? That's your business. But don't insult me just because I added a little class to the inauguration. What about your kids? Are you worried about them? I'm a mother. Of course, I'm worried about them. I'm an Italian mother. Of course, I'm always worried about them. You need <laughs> eat more, honey. Brush your teeth. Say your prayers. Uh, I'm worried about them because they are in the spotlight a little bit, even mm -hmm. though George and I definitely right. shield them from that. We right. don't post pictures of them much anywhere. And uh, they're big Trump fans. They've met the president, of course. And they, I think they really feel the blessing of being able to know what their mom's, um, you know, what their mom's role is as part of this team. The other thing is they're all so different. They all reply so differently. My daughter Charlotte left me a note that I keep right there. She's eight. You know, I love you, mom. Thanks for saving the country. And I can't wait to see you be the first female president. She doesn't realize all I was doing was preserving her ability to be the first yes. female president. My son, the day out, he's 12, the day after the election said, mom, I just want to know what data analytics you and your team had that made you see something in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania that the others did not because we kept sending back, you know, we had a big digital and data team and you kept sending, all of you kept sending back Pence and Trump to Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Wisconsin, Minnesota for that matter, Michigan. So they've all approached it so differently. Um, I told my daughter Claudia who said, I don't want to come to Washington DC and be known as Kellyanne Conway's daughter. And I said, if you cure cancer, honey, I'll be known as Claudia Conway's mother. And then of course the littlest one, Vanessa, she just thinks it's, um, I was telling her I was going on PBS or something, and she said, is that the News Hour show? You know, they're just so, they know so much more than I did when I was triple their age. Yeah. And so in many ways, it's a gift that way. It is a gift. Kellyanne Conway, you're a gift. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank being with us. Thank you so much. Us. God bless you.